Hi everyone, welcome back. We're now going to get into our second advanced counting technique. So our first advanced counting technique was recurrence relations. Now we're getting into generating functions. Now generating functions provide us a very new and powerful way of counting. They're not entirely unfamiliar to us though. If we think about the binomial coefficients, these were objects that counted something. So for example, n choose k counted the number of subsets of size k of a set of size n. It also counted the number of binary strings of length n with exactly k ones. It also was the coefficient of x to the k, y to the n minus k, and the expansion of x plus y to the n. So these three things were interesting in that the first two were objects that we were interested in counting, whereas the last one was something that came from algebra. And this starts to indicate that maybe in algebra we can pull out some ideas to do with counting. So maybe hidden in algebra, maybe lurking in the underseats of algebra, there's actually some counting going on and we can exploit that. And that's really what generating functions are all about. It's about getting algebra to do the counting for us. And so we'll see a bunch of examples today where we actually get algebra to do the counting for us. It's, it's really a very cool idea, bringing the ideas from algebra into combinatorics. So let's first look at an example. So this example was one plus x all cubed. We know that from the binomial theorem that when we expand this out, we get a polynomial of degree three and the various coefficients are going to be these binomial coefficients. But I wanna look at the connection between this binary strings of length n with exactly k ones and this, these coefficients in the expansion. So let's have a look. In order to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write one as x to the power of zero. Seems sort of a funny thing to do, but we're gonna do that anyway. So when I cube that expression, I'm really taking the product of x to the power of zero plus x to the power of one multiplied by itself three times. And, I, and again, I've also put a exponent of one on the x rather than just leaving it as x alone, because I'm trying to bring in the idea of binary strings into this. When we expand this, we can expand this in many different ways. We can just go ahead and take two terms, multiply them out, and then expand it with the, the third term multiplied in there. Or we can do it a little bit more strategically. I'm gonna do it a little bit more strategically. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say, let's multiply all the value, all the x's with zero in the exponent. So those are those three there. So when I multiply all those together, I get x zero, x zero times x zero. Of course, that's just one times one times one, which is one. But if I write it like this, I'm gonna to start to see a pattern emerge. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how can I get an x term? So how can I get just a single x alone? Well, that's equivalent to having an x to the zero times an x to the zero times an x to the one in all the different possible configurations. So I could take, let's say, this x to the one, and I could multiply it to that x to the zero and this x to the zero. Or I could take this x to the one and multiply it to this x to the zero and this x to the zero, and so on. So what I could have is I could use x to the zero from the first one, x to the zero from the second one, but the x to the one from the third one. And that would come out. Uh, out of the full expansion, this would be a term that comes out eventually. But I could also get x to the zero from the first one, x to the one from the second one, and x to the zero from the third one. That would be a term that comes out eventually. And I also get x to the 1 from the first one, x to the 0 from the second one, and x to the 0 from the third one. That would eventually come out. So I've just grouped them up in sort of a column, just so 
they're all sitting together. Note each one of those is just x. So there's x plus x plus x. So there's really three x's sitting there. We'll write that out in a second. Now let's see how can I get x to the power of 2. Well that would involve having an x to the 0 and 2x to the 1's. So I could have an x to the 0 from the first one. So that uses this. And then I'll use the x to the 1's from the second and the third one. So that becomes x to the 0, x to the 1, x to the 1. But I could also have an x to the 1 from the first one and use the x to the 0 from the second one and an x to the 1 from the third one. Or I could use an x to the 1 from the first one, an x to the 1 from the second one, and an x to the 0 from the third one. So all of those terms will eventually come out when I expand it. And I've just grouped them together. Lastly, I could get x to the 1 times x to the 1 times x to the 1. And so that gives me this term here. And there we go. There's our expansion. And it's our expansion that we got by not doing too much all at once. I didn't say x to the 0 was 1 and then collapse everything down. I just left it in its fully expanded form. In the next step, we could certainly collapse it down. x to the 0 times x to the 0 times x to the 0. That's just 1. And then I've grouped all those three which is essentially an x. So x to the 0 times x to the 0 times x to the 1 is just x. So I've got three of them there. I also had three x squares grouped there. And then I also had an x cubed. Now, that's normally how you probably would have done the expansion. You probably would have gone from here to here, maybe even just appealing directly to the binomial theorem because the binomial theorem would say, oh, the number that's going to be here, that's 3 choose 0. This number sitting here is 3 choose 1. This number sitting here is 3 choose 2. And this number sitting here is 3 choose 3. So those are the coefficients in the expansion of this binomial. But we've done this sort of funny thing in the middle. Why have we done that? Well, the reason we've done that is to make the connection with binary strings. So now if I look at these powers, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on all the way across, what we have is that through algebra, we have listed binary strings of length 3. And we've actually grouped them by how many ones they have. So we've got 0, 0, 0. We have 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0. And we have 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. And we had 1, 1, 1. So maybe I'll fill these ones in in green as well. So what we have done is produced the binary strings of length 3 and we've grouped them together, the ones that have exactly 0 ones, 1 1, 2 ones, and 3 ones. So we've made this connection now between the number of binary strings of length n with exactly k ones and the coefficients of the expansion, and we've done it in a way where we actually see the binary strings. They're in this expression as the exponents. So the last observation to make is that the number of binary strings of length n with k ones is the coefficient of x to the k in 1 plus x cubed. Oh, I should say of length 3, because in particular we're working on 3. So the number of binary strings of length 3 with exactly k ones is given by the coefficient of x to the k in the expansion of the binomial 1 plus x raised to the power of 3. So because we are interested in the coefficient of a particular term, we're going to give a definition 
If p is a polynomial, we denote by x to the power of k with square brackets around it placed in front of the name of the polynomial. We use that to denote the coefficient of x to the k in p of x. So let's see how using algebra and polynomials can help us solve this problem. How many integer solutions are there to a1 plus a2 plus a3 equals 7 where ai is a value, an integer, between 0 and 3? So we are interested in, for example, solutions like, and I could have 1 plus 3 plus 3. That's equal to 7. So there a1 is 1, a2 is 3, a3 is 3. So we're interested in all those possible solutions. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to get algebra to do this count for us. How are we going to do that? We are going to think of ai as an exponent in a polynomial. So I'm thinking of a polynomial where the exponent can be you know, a1, the possible values of a1, 0, 1, 2, or 3. So I've got x to the 0. I'm also going to have one that corresponds to a1 being 1, a1 being 2, a1 being 3. So I'm thinking of a1 as the exponent in a polynomial, and these are all the possible terms I can get. And I'm going to do the same thing for a2. a2 can be any of these exponents. So what I'm thinking about here are these are the values of a1. These are the values of a2, and so on. We got our values of a3. Why have I done this? Well, the reason I've done this is because now what happens when I multiply this all out? When I expand it all out, I get something times 1 plus something times x plus something times x squared plus all the way down the line dot 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 plus something times x to the 7 plus dot 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 plus something times x to the 9. What are these some things in here, these are our coefficients. These are going to be the number of ways I could make that corresponding x to a power from the multiplication. So now let's think about that x to the 7. What's going to be sitting in front of here? Well, it's going to be all the possible ways I could make an x to the 7 by multiplying a power of x in each one of these factors. So how could I make an x to the 7? Well, I could make x to the 7 as follows. I could make it as, let's think about, could I use an x to the 0 from the first one? If I did, then I'd have to be able to make an x to the 7 by multiplying two of these. But they only go up to, to 3 each, so I could only make something as high as a power of x to the 6. So I'll use an x to the 1. So I can make it with an x to the 1 and then what can I multiply it by? Well I could multiply it by an x to the 3 and an x to the 3. So I could make it by using an x to the 1 from the first factor, an x to the 3 from the second, and an x to the 3 from the third. Or I could use an x to the 3 from the first, an x to the 1 from the second, x to the 3 from the third, or so on. 
those are three different ways I can make an x to the 7. I could also make it by taking an x to the 2 from the first, and now I just need to make an x to the 5. To make an x to the 5, I could use an x to the 2 from the second, and an x to the 3 from the third, or an x to the 3 from the second, and an x to the 2 from the third. That's the only ways I could make it using an x to the 2 from the first one. So how about using an x to the 3 from the first one? Well, then I'd have to make an x to the 4 of the remaining. And I can make an x to the 4 of the remaining by either using a 1 and 3 or a 3 and 1, which I've already done. Or I could use a 2 and a 2. And so I could make an x to the 7 in six possible ways. So there's six ways to make x to the 7. And how does this relate back to the original question? We've actually listed out those solutions. So the solutions to the original problem are 1, 3, 3, 3, 1, 3, 3, 1, 3, 3, 1. So I'm just listing these exponents because those are the exponents that, those are values that add up to 7. And then these ones as well. So we get 2, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, and finally 3, 2, 2. And those are all the possible solutions. So there are six possible solutions to the original problem. So how many solutions are there to the original problem? There are six. So therefore, six solutions. Now the way we did it was we used algebra. And you may say, well, not really, because what you really did was you kind of made it more complicated, and then you ended up just listing the solutions anyway. And sure, because I... I had to illustrate what was going on behind the scenes, but now that we know what's going on behind the scenes, we can find the solution to this problem without actually having to list them in this way, because what we can do is we can just do the following. We can say, hey, I'm interested in knowing what the coefficient of x to the 7 is for 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed raised to the power of 3. So I'll just have Wolfram Alpha expand. Yep, there it is down at the bottom, expanded form. And I just look, what is the coefficient of x to the 7? Coefficient of x to the 7 is 6. So there we go. We've solved the counting problem. The counting problem was to find the number of solutions to a1 plus a2 plus a3 equal to 7. We recognized that we could get algebra to do that count for us, so we had algebra do its thing, and we came up with a value of 6. This is the power of these counting methods that we're about to develop. So you might say, well, uh, great, but are we allowed to use then computing tools to do this for us? No, I'm trying to just illustrate the ideas that algebra is lurking behind the scenes and it could do the counting for us. This is sort of a, a very introductory problem into how we can get algebra to do the work for us. But typically, you know, if you want a, a quick and, and a dirty answer to these problems, absolutely, just fire it into a computer algebra system and have it do the work for you and work out the value. But we'll actually see that in the instances we're interested in, when things get a little bit more complicated and these counting problems become a little bit more difficult, that it's not about having a computer do the calculation for us, it's about being able to set up the problem as a algebra type problem, as a generating function type problem, as we'll come to know these as. And then we'll see how to do these calculations and extract the coefficients. We can do them by hand. But, you know, at this stage, absolutely we can use a computer to do the uh, calculation for us to spit out the coefficient that we're interested in. But we'll see eventually that we can do these things by hand. So let's go ahead and look at a, another example. Suppose we want to roll two die, and we're going to add the values of the dice. How many ways can we get six? You might say, well, you already know how to do this. Yeah, and the idea is I want to show that we can get polynomials in algebra to do this count for us. So how do we do that? 
Well, let's first indicate that we already know how to do this problem. The number of ways we can get 6 is we can get a 1 and a 5. We can get a 2 and a 4, a 3 and a 3, a 4 and a 2, or a 5 and a 1. So there are five ways. This is equivalent to the number of solutions to r1 plus r2 is equal to 6, where ri is trapped between 1 and 6. So that's what it's equivalent to, where this is our die 1 roll, and this is the roll we have on die 2. And we've already seen that we can get algebra to do this for us. How would we do it? Well, we would set up a polynomial, x to the various values that R is, R1 is allowed to take on. So it can be x1, x2, plus x3, plus x4, plus x5, plus x6. And then we multiply that by the same one for die number 2, so 3, 4, 5, and I'm going to run out of room, so I'll move it over just a little bit. So that's x to the 5 plus x to the 6. And let's call this polynomial p. And what we are interested in is we are interested in the coefficient of x to the 6. How do I get an x to the 6? Well, I would get, you know, we can see how we could get an x to the 6. I could multiply an x to the 1 times an x to the 5, an x to the 2 times an x to the 4, an x to the 3 times an x to the 3, an x to the 4 times an x to the 2, or an x to the 5 times an x to the 1. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different ways to get an x to the 6. So we are interested in the coefficient of x to the 6th of p of x. And we can see that we can get this coefficient just by matching these corresponding values. And what we get is that there are five ways to get an x to the 6th. So our coefficient would be 5. So that's a way to work out the value of this problem. We did it one way by actually listing them. We did it another way by recognizing the solution comes from a coefficient of a polynomial. Now here's the power in this approach. So what we'll do is we'll do x to the power of 1. So this is the polynomial for the first die roll. x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth plus x to the fifth plus x to the sixth. And we're going to raise it to the power of 2. And we are interested in the coefficient of x to the 6. So we can even tell us it to do that. Coefficient, and then I'll put parentheses around this, of that thing, where it's a polynomial in x, and we want the coefficient corresponding to x to the 6. Or you could just do plain language. Coefficient of this thing. Um, of x to the of x to the six, you can do plain language as well. But I'll just write it like this, and tell Wolfram Alpha to go ahead and compute this value, and it comes back and it says the result is five. And so there we go. We had algebra do our count for us. I said there was a nice, powerful method to this approach that extends beyond where we currently are. So. What I will do is I will just work out the whole polynomial. And if I square it, I get the whole polynomial. It's not showing it to me, so I'm going to have to tell it to do that. OK, expand. And now it's going to give me the full polynomial. It says there's 11 terms. And we can look right up on the polynomial that there's the x to the 6, and its coefficient is 5 in front of it. So that tells me that if I roll 2 die, and I want to know how many ways can I get a 6. I can get it in five different ways. 
But this also tells me a whole bunch more. It tells me how many ways I can get a 7, how many ways I can get an 8, 9, a 10, 11, a 12. It tells me how many ways I can get any possible sum of the roll of two die. But here's what's even better about this. Is what happens if I say, let's roll the die three times? What are the possible values I can get? Well, if I roll three die, then I will get the minimum value is a three that I will get for the sum, and the maximum would be six plus six plus six or 18. And I want to know how many different ways there are to get those values from three to 18. I can just bump this up to a three and have it compute it. And there we go. 16 term polynomial goes from x to the 3 all the way up to x to the 18 and we can immediately see how many ways there are to get each of those die rolls. The most popular die roll, the one that we can get most frequently is, well there's two of them, 10 and 11. There are 27 ways to get a 10 and 27 ways to get an 11. How about if I rolled 7 die? Well, there's really no stopping this. We can get any value between x to the 7 and x to the 42, and we can see exactly how many ways we can get each sum, just as the coefficients of a polynomial. This is the power of using what we call generating functions, or getting algebra to do counts for us. This is, we're only, this is only the tip of the iceberg here, but this does indicate the power that's involved in this approach to counting. So let's just summarize what we've done in this last example. So I said we can encode the number of ways k can be rolled as the coefficient of a polynomial. So this is now we're rolling two die, and the coefficient of x to the k in this polynomial is going to be the number of ways we can produce k as the sum of two die roll. There's one way to get a two, there's two ways to get a three, there's three ways to get a four, and so on. There's six ways to get a seven, and all the way up. There's only one way to get a 12. So there's our polynomial. The next thing is, is that we can write a polynomial down, which counts the possible outcomes for rolling a single die. And that is just the one we've written down up above. How many ways can you get a one on a single die? Well, there's only one way. How many ways can you get a two? There's only one way. How many ways can you get a 3? There's only one way. How many ways can you get a 4? Just one way. And a 5. And a 6. So there's our polynomial for the outcomes, for the number of ways, sorry, for the number of ways to get each outcome on the die. The outcomes are the exponents, and the number of ways to get them are the coefficients. And then I said, oh, you're ready for it. What is the square of this polynomial q? It turns out, as we've already verified, and we see the reason why. Right here is really the reason why. We looked at it just for the coefficient of x to the 6, but we can see now that when I square q of x, I end up just getting p of x. I end up getting the polynomial which encodes the distribution for the sum of two die rolls. And if I cubed it, I'd get the distribution for three die rolls, and so on. So that's just to summarize what we did um, through our previous example, and then also what we talked about with Wolfram Alpha and doing our calculations. So let's extend this a little bit more and do some more examples. So how many integer solutions does this equation have? a1 plus a2 plus a3 equals 9, where we've got the conditions that a1 is trapped between 2 and 4, a2 is trapped between 1 and 5, and a3 is trapped between 3 and 7. Now if you think about our techniques we've had up till now for counting, this would be a bit of a challenge. Um, we're probably better off just listing them all at this stage. Uh, the methods we had before was uh, counting with repetition, and so we'd say if a1 is bigger than 2, then we'd subtract 2 from both sides and then say it was bigger than or equal to 0, but the problem is we've got an upper bound there. So this is a challenging problem to count but not if we think about it in terms of polynomials. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let one factor of my polynomial be all the possible values of a1. So 
I'm going to put those in the exponents. So a1 could be 2, it could be 3, or it could be 4. And again, the reason we're doing this, I just want to reiterate, because it is easy to get lost in this and, and lose sight of the big picture. But the main idea is that we are putting these numbers in the exponent because when we multiply these things, we add the exponents. And that's the problem that's being asked here, is it's an addition problem. So when I multiply these expressions out, I add their exponents. So I'm mimicking the addition that's happening here. And I actually get a whole bunch of additions, all possible additions when I do the expansion. So what is our A2 polynomial? Well, it's A2 is allowed to have a value of either 1, 2, 3, 4, and I drew that a little too close, or 5. What about A3? It could have a value of 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. And so what are we interested in? We are interested in the coefficient of x to the 9 in this polynomial. That's what we want to find. So what is our coefficient of x to the 9? As I said, we will learn methods for figuring out what these coefficients are without having to have a computer do the calculation for us. But that'll, that'll come eventually. Right now, we can be certainly content with saying, hey, a computer can do this for us. Let's get it to do it for us. So we'll go back to Wolfram Alpha. We'll go ahead and we'll pop in the polynomial we're interested in. We'd like it to expand this, so if I just hit enter, it may expand it, it may not, but let's force Wolfram Alpha to expand this. So we'll tell it to expand this for us. We could actually ask for a specific coefficient, but it's not so hard in this case just to look it up from that result. So we see the expanded form, we're interested in the coefficient of x to the 9, and we see it's 9. And so there we go, we got our value of 9. So I will indicate here that we did use Wolfram Alpha. In other words, we used a computer to compute that value. Um, we will learn other methods to do this later, but it's fine to use a computer for right now. We're still getting a feel for what's going on here, what the purpose of uh, using polynomials to do the counts for us, to see that they're actually a powerful tool and worth learning about. And then once we, once we are feeling that motivated, then we can move beyond having a computer do this calculation for us and see what the real power is of, these, of this approach to, to enumeration and counting. So let's go ahead and look at the next one. What if a1 is odd, a2 is even, and a3 is 0, 3, or 6? How could we do that problem? Well, hopefully at this stage you're starting to see that it's really very straightforward to write down a polynomial for which a certain coefficient is going to answer our problem for us. So we want a1 to be uh, odd. So in other words, a1 could be 1, it could be 3, it could be 5, it could be 7. Could it be 9? Well, that would mean a2 and a3 have to be 0. Yeah, it could be. A2 has to be even. A3 could be 0, 3, and 6. So yeah, it could go up to 9. Could A1 be 11? No, because as soon as A1 is bigger than 9, there's, there's no solution with that value. So we can stop here. What about A2? Well, it's got to be even. So it could be x to the 0. Typically, don't write that now that we're sort of used to what it is we're doing. So instead of x to the 0, I'll just write a 1. It could be x squared, x to the 4, x to the 6, or x to the 8. And the polynomial for a3 is x to the 0, which is 1, plus x cubed, plus x to the 6. And again, we're looking for the coefficient of x to the 9. So what is our coefficient of x to the 9? P of x. Well, we can have a computer do the calculation for us and extract the coefficient. And when we do that, we get a value of 7. 
So again, we used a, a computer to do this calculation in the end. But the idea is we have expressed our solution as the coefficient of a polynomial. So this is really the key thing here. This is our answer. It's the coefficient of x to the 9 of this polynomial p of x. That's our answer. What does it work out to be? Well, there's its numerical value. So this is like leaving our answer in a sort of at this stage, it's like leaving our answer in a calculator ready form. This is the numerical result. However, at this stage, even though this is really the important part, this form here, that it's x to the 9, of uh, the coefficient of x to the 9 of p of x, um, at this stage we can work it out. We can just work it out using Wolfram Alpha. But as I said, I'm sort of repeating myself here, but as I said, we will learn techniques for finding these values as well without having to appeal to a computer. Let's have a look at the next example. How many integer solutions does a1 plus a2 plus a3 equal to n have, which satisfy that a1, a2, and a3 are all greater than or equal to 0? Now before we start getting into the mode of, okay, I'm going to set up a polynomial, etc., just realize we already know the answer to this. So from before, this is it's the number of ways to choose n from 3 with repetition. So we're going to choose n from 3 with repetition. So in other words, it's n plus 2, choose n. So we already know this. This was precisely the counting problem that we've studied in the past. However, we can look at it also from the perspective of these polynomials, what we call generating functions. So our new approach is as follows. We say, what is it? Well, it's going to be the coefficient, some coefficient of a polynomial. What's the polynomial? The polynomial is going to have three factors. The first one is going to have the possible values that a1 can have in the exponent. So it could be a1 could be 0 or a1 could be 1, or 2, all the way up to a1 could be n. Then there's going to be another factor for a2, another factor for a3, so in fact there'll be three of these all together. And we are interested in, so the solution is, the coefficient of x to the n in p of x. So there we go. That's what we're interested in. And in fact, what we have now just really shown from looking at this problem from these two different perspectives is that the coefficient of x to the n of this p to the x is actually n plus 2 choose n. So we actually already know it. Um, and so we can think about this in a different way. We can think, suppose the problem is we had an expression like this, and we needed to figure out the coefficient of x to the n once it was expanded all out. Well, the coefficient of x to the n is just the number of solutions there, all to, there are to this equation, and we already know how to count that. That's n plus 2 choose n. So we're able to find the coefficient of x to the n in this sort of generalized version of like a binomial theorem. And so that's an, an interesting observation to make. Here's another interesting observation to make. So note that if we take, maybe I'll, I'll change it a little bit, I'll say q of x, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the same first part, x to the n, but then I'm just going to keep going, x to the n plus 1, plus dot, 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 and I'm going to continue it on forever. Now it's an infinite series. And I'm going to raise that to the power of 3. And then I'm going to look at the coefficient of x to the n in this product. The thing to observe now 
is that when I expand this all out, all of these extra terms I added on, they aren't going to affect the coefficient of x to the n because they all involve higher powers of n. So these are not going to have any effect on the value of the coefficient of x to the n that I got from just taking this and raising it to the power of 3. So this is equal to just the coefficient of x to the n of p of x. Okay, so that's an interesting thing to observe because, maybe I'll slide this down just a little bit, because this infinite series, 1 plus x plus x squared and so on, we could write that in a simpler form. That's a geometric series. So I could write that as 1 over 1 minus x, and that's being cubed. And so what I have is that 1 over 1 minus x all cubed. I've got this function. If I was to write it as an infinite series, then the coefficients of that function are solving my original problem. They solve the original problem here. So this tells us that now we have an interest in knowing what the coefficients of x to the k are in 1 over 1 minus x cubed when written as an infinite series. Because the coefficients of that are going to be precisely the coefficients we want. In fact, we already know what the coefficients are now, so we actually have something even better. We know that the coefficients are going to be this. So if I was to take this expression, write it as an infinite series, then those are my coefficients. For those of you who have taken calculus, you know in calculus too that one of the main objectives is to find Taylor series expansions of functions. So this is about taking a function and writing it as an infinite series and finding those coefficients are related to higher derivatives and the like. But we're also seeing that same idea is now appearing here in discrete mathematics. So this isn't a calculus problem, this is a discrete math problem, but we see they're really asking for the same thing. So in both cases, the question is about taking a function and expanding it as an infinite series. So this is where techniques from calculus can help us in discrete math, and techniques from discrete math can help us in calculus. So uh, both subjects can scratch each other's backs in this regard. So the idea here is that we are interested in solving counting problems still, but now we have a new approach. The new approach is we can make a connection with polynomials and powers of polynomials in extracting coefficients, and in some cases we can even go as far as constructing infinite series. So this gives rise to our main topic of this section, and that is the topic of generating functions. So what is a generating function? Well, the idea is we still have a sequence lurking in the background, just like we did for recurrence relations. There's a sequence, these values a0, a1, a2, and so on, they are representing some counting sequence. So these are the number of ways to do something for 0, for 1, for 2. So there's something we're interested in, in counting and finding the values of. We take this sequence and we just stick them in as coefficients of a polynomial. That polynomial, or series in this case because it's infinite, that series is what we call a generating function. All it is, it's just a way to encode our infinitely long sequence as a single object, and the single object is a function. And its coefficients are just the terms of our sequence. So let's see what we can do with this. What is the generating function for 1, 1, 1? So there's our sequence. So our generating function. 
it's 1 plus 1 times x, so I'll just write that as x, plus 1 times x squared, plus 1 times x cubed, plus dot, dot, dot. So there's our generating function for that sequence. Now here's the nice thing about this, is is there a way to represent this infinite series in a finite way, in some, by some finite representation? And the idea is, yeah, absolutely. This is a geometric series. So we can always write it as 1 over 1 minus x. And so this is the generating function. This is what we call the generating function, gf for short, for the sequence 1, 1, 1, dot, 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 forever. The analogy I like to make here is this idea of data compression. We had this infinite collection of objects, and we found a way to compress them into a finite object. And that finite object is a representation of that sequence. From that finite object, 1 over 1 minus x, I can extract the sequence from it, and I can get back to the 1, 1, 1, 1. So I can do this idea of I've got this infinite collection of data, I can compress it into a finite object. But then if I want to get back, I can uncompress it. So it's like zipping it and then unzipping it. So that's a, a quite a powerful idea because we're now able to take infinite objects and represent them with finite objects. It's very cool. So let's have a look at a, another example. So what is the generating function for this sequence? So we've got ax is equal to 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus 4x cubed plus 5x to the fourth plus dot dot dot. So we've got this infinite sequence. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to find some sort of closed form expression for this, some sort of finite representation for it. How can I do that? Well, let's see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say we already know that b of x, which is that one from the previous page that I'll write out, that's 1 over 1 minus x. So that's a good one to know. Because now what I can do is I can take a of x and subtract b of x from it. When I do the subtraction, what do I get? I get 1 minus 1, which is 0, 2x minus x, which is just x, 3x squared minus x squared, which is 2x squared, 4x cubed minus x cubed, which is 3x cubed, 5x to the fourth minus x to the fourth, which is 4x to the fourth, and so on. I can factor out an x from all those, and I get 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus 4x cubed plus dot dot dot. Well, that just gets me back to a again. So that's x times a of x, and that's a of x minus b of x. So that means now I can solve for a. a of x is equal to b of x over 1 minus x. But b of x was 1 over 1 minus x, so this becomes a 1 over 1 minus x all squared. And so there we go. We have found our generating function for our sequence of consecutive integers. So we've got a sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. We encoded it as the coefficients of an infinite series, and we've just worked out that an alternate representation for that infinite series is 1 over 1 minus x all squared. And so that's our generating function for our sequence. So we've got 1 over 1 minus x all squared is the generating function for 
one, two, three, four, and so on. Now, for those familiar with calculus, you may have seen how to do this in another way. So an alternate solution. It's not necessary to know calculus in order to do the material in this course, but of course, if there are opportunities for us to see that the knowledge we have from other courses can also help us learn the material from this course, then I'm going to be all over those opportunities. And so this is another one of those opportunities. What's our alternate solution? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look up at b of x. That's 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus dot dot dot. That's 1 over 1 minus x. Now let's just differentiate. I take the derivative with respect to x in this case. When I do that, I get 1 plus 2x plus 3x squared plus dot dot dot. Ah, that's our function a of x. So the derivative of b of x is a of x. Well, that means then that the derivative of the closed form expression of it, that 1 over 1 minus x, is going to be a closed form expression for this series. So when I differentiate this, I can use the power rule if I want to write it as 1 minus x to the negative 1, or I can use the quotient rule. The bottom line is, when I do a derivative, I get 1 over 1 minus x all squared. And so there's an alternate method for seeing why 1 over 1 minus x all squared is the closed form for this generating function for the sequence of consecutive integers. All right, so again, a summary of what we've done. We introduced the idea of a polynomial to help us do the counting. And we saw how we can attach to the coefficients of polynomials the idea that these actually count something. And so we can use algebra to do the counts for us. And then at the end, we said, OK, we are interested in these counting sequences. Let's stick those in as the coefficients of a infinite series. That infinite series is what we call the generating function for that sequence. So questions about the sequence and figuring out their values can now be translated into questions about algebra of the functions that give those sequences, the generating functions. So as we move forward, we're going to work on how to manipulate generating functions and get them to help us solve counting problems. All right, so thanks very much for watching. And we'll see you again next time.